Hey guys, so today, uh, go ahead and get out your civil rights leaders notes. That's the chart at the bottom of your civil rights leader or civil rights events uh, packet. So we're going to be talking through some of the major leaders of the civil rights movement. Some names might be very familiar to you. Some names might not be. Uh, but what's really important to kind of understand about these people as we're talking through them is that there are a lot of different philosophies of how African Americans in our country were going to be fighting for civil rights. Uh, and all of these men uh, and some women went through it very differently. And so today you're going to kind of get to see a good overview of all of that and kind of how that happened. Um, so we're going to start with probably probably the most famous leader of the civil rights movement, which is uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. So uh, Dr. King, as you may know, was a pastor uh, named after Martin Luther, who was the Protestant Reformation leader from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance era. And he first kind of came into um, public knowledge when he was living in Montgomery and was chosen to be the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, now, his real main philosophy was nonviolent resistance. His idea was he really believed that if we show that we are better, if we show that we are not willing to succumb to the things that people are doing to us, then we will be able to integrate peacefully and show that we are willing to work with society. Um, his idea was he wanted to work with the white population and to integrate into the white population. Uh, he really believed that African Americans should be treated as equals to rights um, or to whites. His main four influences here that he has, first of all, are Mahatma Gandhi. So Gandhi, as you may know, was the leader of the Indian movement uh, for civil rights in India. And he was one of the first people in the early 1900s to really speak out about nonviolence and what that could do. So that's where he kind of gets his nonviolence philosophy from. As a pastor, of course, uh, religion played a very big role in Dr. King's life. And, of course, part of the teachings of Christ, of Jesus, is love your enemy, right? So this idea that even if you are, you know, if someone hits you on the side of the face, you turn the other cheek, right? Um, so loving your enemy or loving those who hurt you or harm you, that was a big part of that as well. From Henry David Thoreau, he gets this idea of civil disobedience. Uh, so basically what this means is if you believe that there is a law that is unfair or unconstitutional, you choose to not follow that law. And you don't make a scene about it, right? You don't just go out there and protest it. You just say, I'm not going to do this. Um, Thoreau, when he was alive, he was protesting the War of 1812, and he chose not, or the Mexican-American War, sorry, uh, and he chose not to pay his taxes uh, during that time to say, I'm not going to support this war. So one of the things that you'll see a lot that Dr. King talks about is, you know, protest peacefully. They're probably going to arrest you. If they do, go to jail. And when they let you out, do it all over again. Um, so you're saying that, you know, jail is not going to hold me down, right? And then, of course, um, he does draw some influences from people who are more contemporary to him, uh, namely a Philip Randolph. So we mentioned him during World War II, and he helped lead a protest uh, during World War II for discrimination in African Americans in the workplace during that time. Uh, and one of the things that he does is leads these mass demonstrations, the marches on Washington, D.C., to kind of show the point. Again, they are peaceful protests, uh, but it's the idea that you show this mass amount of support. And you see this with Dr. King with, like, the mark on, March on Washington, right? So these are going to be where he gets his four major influences from. Uh, in terms of his accomplishments, uh, he founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or SCLC. Uh, this is going to be the main organization that does a lot of the protests that Dr. King is involved in during the civil rights movement. He is very popular. Um, he is seen as kind of a more moderate leader. A lot of um, whites and blacks were on his side. Uh, as you know, he was the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott, which was successful. 
when he was arrested in Birmingham for his protest, so this is that civil disobedience idea, he writes this letter called Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And this letter is one of the most important documents that we have from him, uh, where he talks about kind of why he did what he did. He was actually writing to other um, black pastors in the South who said, well, you know, if we're going to get arrested, we need to stop doing this. And he was like, look, like, no, you don't. You need to keep doing this because what we're fighting for is very important. He does lead the March on Washington. Um, that is where he will give his I Have a Dream speech. Thousands of people show up to this march, and it's you know a way of showing the federal government, like, look, we need a civil rights bill. This is something that lots of people are supporting. And unfortunately, as we know, uh, Dr. King was assassinated in Tennessee in 1968, uh, what you may not know is that he was actually supposed to be giving a speech at Winston-Salem in Wake For at Wake Forest University at that time. Uh, however, when um, the garbage workers in Tennessee went on strike, he decided to go there instead in order to support their strike. Uh, he is shot when he is on the porch of his hotel. Uh, he was with several of his kind of main number one guys, and uh, it was a huge hit for the civil rights movement uh, and definitely caused a lot of mass mourning throughout the country, especially for people who really supported him uh, and really had a major effect on the movement and what was going to come from that. So I just want to show you a couple of photographs here. Um, so over here you can see this is a photograph of Dr. King in Birmingham. Um, this is his mugshot for when he is arrested. Um, let me just move this down here a little bit. Uh, you can see this top picture. You know, he is a family man. He does have children. Um, and something that I think is important to understand is there's always this scandal you hear about where like, oh, well, didn't he have an affair? Yeah, he did. He was human. He wasn't perfect. Uh, we have to remember that these leaders, you know, they are human. But does the fact that he did that take away from his work in civil rights? Absolutely not. Um, so that's just kind of important to keep in mind as we're, you know, as you talk through him and you study him, you'll hear a lot of people kind of throw that in your face or say, well, you know, he wasn't a good person because he did this. Well, he still fought for civil rights and he still said some really great things. Um, this picture down here at the bottom right, that is from the March on Washington. I love this photograph just because um, he just looks so happy in this picture, and you just see the thousands of people who are at this March on Washington. And then the photograph at the top is actually from the hotel where he is assassinated. So this was taken just before he is killed. Uh, and like I said, the assassination of Dr. King is going to lead to some really major um it's a really major hit for the civil rights movement, uh, but it does kind of allow for some changes in the civil rights movement as well. The next person that we have, um, who again you may have heard of for, is Malcolm X. So Malcolm X is often thought about as a lot more radical, the opposite of Dr. King. And one thing that he is the opposite of is that he did not believe that African Americans should try to integrate into white society. He's actually pro-segregation. He believes that we should separate from white society. Uh, however, he does believe also in immediate change for African Americans. And if that change had to come in the form of violence, that was something he was okay with. Uh, now, he did try to mostly say it's self-defense. If they hit me, I'm not turning the other cheek. I'm hitting back, right? And one of the things that you'll really read about him, and a part of this is from his religion, is he really just blames white white population for what's happening in the country at the time. Uh, and, you know, you hear a lot of his speeches, and a lot of it is pretty intense stuff. He refers to the white devil quite a lot. And like I said, a lot of this comes from his religious beliefs. So in 1964, he joined a religion called the Nation of Islam. You'll also hear it called the Black Muslims. And this is an organization, um, or a religious group, rather, that is a faction of Islam, uh, but it is unique to the United States. It actually began in the 1960s in the United States, and it is mostly African Americans. And one of the things that they really talk about um, is that, you know, we should try to form this separate black society. Uh, and he becomes kind of the leader of the separatist group because of that. Uh, he's seen as very militant, very radical. Uh, he goes on speaking tours all around the country. 
one of the things he does is he really criticizes Dr. King and this nonviolence idea. Uh, however, as a Muslim, one of the things that he chooses to do is go to a uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. Mecca is the most holy city for Muslims. Uh, it is where most Muslims try to go at one point in their life. It was the city of Muhammad uh, where he was born. And while he was there, what he realizes is that he saw people of all races who were worshiping God together. Black, white, tan, everybody, right? And so after he goes on his pilgrimage to Mecca, he becomes more tolerant of race relations and he realizes that we're all human, right? And so he starts to talk about how, well, maybe we can integrate into society. Maybe we can um, work with the white population. And a lot of this um, rhetoric, this change in his rhetoric, makes people who were part of his group a little uncomfortable. So much so that they actually said, well, you're going back on what you used to say and you're going to hurt us. And in, when he is assassinated in 1965, he is actually killed by people who were once followers of him. Basically, they wanted to shut him up. They said, you're going soft. We don't want you as part of this anymore. Uh, so again, I often think we think about Malcolm X as being very radical and very militant, and that's not to say he wasn't. But I also think it's important to understand that he did change his thought process uh, as he continues on. I also think it's important to understand that he is actually assassinated before Dr. King. Uh, I think that's something we also didn't think of him as coming later, uh, but they were actually around at the same time, and they talked these different ideas at the same time. Uh, and like I said, he's assassinated before Dr. King is. So just some pictures here. Uh, so uh, these photographs at the top are just a couple pictures of him um, as part of his speaking tour. And I think that this picture over here especially is often how he is depicted. Uh, we don't really think of the softer side, so to speak, of uh, Malcolm X. The picture down here at the bottom is a photograph of him in Egypt, the color photograph, uh, where he was on his way to Mecca. Uh, so that's kind of in the middle of his change. And then I just like the picture, the other picture down there at the bottom. Again, it's a different side of Malcolm X that we don't often think about. Uh, so the next person that we have is a guy named Stokely Carmichael. So Stokely Carmichael uh, was actually part of... Um, at first of Dr. King's movement. He was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. SNCC was part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, it was the student branch of that. And he starts as being this nonviolent protester. However, as protests start to kind of heat up throughout the country, uh, he becomes more and more unhappy with the nonviolent movement. He says, basically, it's not working, and we need to do something that works. So as that happens, he becomes more militant, much more like um, maybe Malcolm X was. He founds a movement called the Black Power Movement, um, where he says, basically, what we need to do is we need to be defiant, um, not necessarily violent, now, again, if we get smacked, we're not, we're going to smack back. We're not going to sit around and take it, but we need to like show that we are strong and show that we are, vi are not violent, but show that we are willing to fight back and be defiant. Another thing that's really big of the black power movement is to empower the black community um, to say like, we want our communities to feel like they can build themselves up, that they are not being put down by white society. Uh, and, and one of the things that he does is he leads a, um, a march, similar to the March on Washington, it's called the March Against Fear, and it's part of this um, black power movement to say, like, hey, we don't have to just sit down and take this anymore. Uh, and the reason that people like Stokely Carmichael become more popular is really in the wake of Dr. King's death, where they say, like, look, he was nonviolent. look what happened to him, he got killed. I'm not going to get killed for this. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to stand up and fight for my rights. And that's kind of where his philosophy starts to change. So Stokely Carmichael, um, in order to define what black power means, he says it's a call for black people in this country to unite, to recognize their heritage, to build a sense of community. It's a call for black people to define their own goals and to lead their own organizations. So this idea of black power, again, is this that we can do what we need to do ourselves. We don't have to wait for white people to tell us what to do. Um, and so you'll often see this kind of, this fist pump is the symbol of the Black Power Movement. Um, over here on the right are two uh, African-American uh, Olympic athletes who won the gold and silver, uh, and um, or rather the gold and copper. And they 
on the stand by doing this black power symbol. It was a worldwide recognition of the black power movement and just kind of became more into the light at that point. Um, as part of the black power movement, we also have these guys, uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. So again, they originally come from the black power movement, but what they decide to do is form a political party in 1966 known as the Black Panther Party. So this is a political party that is formed in order to kind of fight against some of the police brutality that was going on in a lot of the African-American communities, especially in the lower income communities. Uh, so again, one of the things that they really talk about is self-defense. Black power was a big part of this, um, using violence if necessary, using armed revolt if we have to. Um, violence played a lot more of a role in the Black Panther Party, um, so much so that actually Richard Nixon had the Black Panther Party on what he called his enemies list. Uh, we'll talk more about what that means later. Uh, they were anti-war in Vietnam. Basically, they said like, hey, black people are being sent to this war to die for a country that won't recognize them, so why should we support them? Um, but one of the other things that the Black Panther Party did, and this is something that I think, again, in order to kind of demonize the Black Panther Party, we kind of forget about this, is they were also really um, wanted to improve the communities that they were in, um, especially the economics of the community. So they helped provide jobs and housing, education. Um, you know, they had daycares and all kinds of things in order to help people in those communities that they were part of. Um, Often when you see the Black Panther Party, you they have kind of like a uniform that they recognize with. They're, they wear all black. They kind of have a beret. Um, but I, I do think it's important to point out that this, of all of these organizations, this is definitely the most militant and even the one that is the most violent. Um, they kind of have two sides to that coin here. Uh, so let's look at just some photographs here. So this is the kind of costume that I was talking about. Um, these are Newton and Seal down here. Uh, up in this top corner, you can see the black, uh, it says Black Community Survival Conference Serve the People, Body, and Soul. So this is just a conference um, to try and help a specific neighborhood. And you can see them doing uh, the black power uh, symbol here. Down at the bottom, this is a uh, like a daycare or an education center uh, for the African Americans in the community. Uh, so I hope that this just kind of gives you some good pictures of kind of what's going on and um, who these leaders are of the civil rights movement. And I think it's important to understand that there are different factions of the civil rights movement. Uh, so we're going to be able to get a little bit more in depth into some of the, the philosophies of these people. Uh, so I will see you soon.